Hello and welcome to another edition of the Truth Proof Livestream. I'm Les and I'm helping to bring Paul bring you uh, the live stream for tonight. Now, I've got to say, great response on the uh, people in the chat who's come onto the stream already. And I've uh, got to thank every, every one of you for coming on and taking time out to uh, listen to our guest tonight. So, I'll just go through a few names so I can say this time I'll start backwards way on on the uh, script here and see who's in the stream tonight. Well, we've got Fred Flintstone, Steve O 71, Lisa Odd, Disabled Welshman, Alex Wingfield, and let's have a look. Stargazer Eternal, did I mention Stargazer? And John, John Alexander, Diane Farrell. We've got uh, Sky. It was doing a moderating for us tonight, folks. This guy's doing a moderating, so any questions, put in caps, please, and ask, yeah, put it towards Sky, and she'll send them through for me to be fired to Paul. And uh, we have Jo, Jojo. Welcome to the show, Jo. Barbara Davis, and let's have a look. I'll just scroll up a little bit more. Plenty of people on. And I think... I probably missed loads of people out. Ian Linford, Steph J, J Leveller, Lee Roscoe, great supporter of the show, as always. Welcome to the show, Lee. And Tony Smith, and lots and lots, and Karen C, Andrew Sheehan, some name call outs there, but you don't want to hear me. I'm going to put you straight on to Paul, who will introduce our guest for tonight. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you, Les, and uh, great to be here. I've uh, I've not been well this last week, so best I've felt, guys. And I'm I'm really pleased to be talking to our guest tonight, Robert Hulse. Uh, describes himself as a lifelong experiencer, abductee, and all-round researcher of the unexplained. And the list could go on and on. So let's just jump into it. Robert, welcome to Truth Proof. Thanks, Paul. It's uh, a great pleasure to be uh, with you tonight. Yeah, looking forward to it yeah yeah me too and it, it, it was a bit of a surprise when you popped up that last 10 minutes last week when david kate and uh, uh were kind enough to spend a few hours with us and uh you, yeah, you kind of jumped on it and we thought this guy's got a lot to say and a lot to share well david and i we've we've been uh, researching uh this stuff since the early 90s we we became great friends and we've spent oh, so much time together you know uh, I've done everything with him, um, the crop mm. circles, the um, animal stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and um, he's been with me uh, when I've been taken, actually, on one occasion down in Wiltshire. Um, you know, we've we've been done a lot of filming together. And, uh, um, yeah, he's a, a very dear friend. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean some people probably won't be aware of you david and we we're going we're to jump back to early beginnings in a moment but yeah besides your own experiences yeah because there's a lot of people out there who've had these experiences who'll never actually speak ever so besides your own experience actually being involved in the subject and researching how many years we're going back um well actually researching it seriously um about 42 years That's yeah time, 42 years um yeah it was probably uh, 1980 uh when i had the big um, event you know with a big craft uh, hovering over me um yeah and uh, uh that triggered mem some memories for me of stuff that had happened in my childhood and um some stuff that i thought would perhaps you know, I dreamt, you know, but when I spoke to my sister about them, oh, she said, no, no, that really happened because she was with me at the time. Yeah. You know, because we were we were taken on two occasions together and and she's had her own experiences all through her life as well, uh, because, of course, this kind of thing runs in the family. Um, you know, my my um, my mom, and my my grandmother and other relatives also have been involved and um well, yeah that's just taken us back nicely then so what do you think your earliest recollection of of these occurrences was 
Well, the first thing, um, strange as it may seem, is when I was about two years old. I might have been three. It's hard to say, but two or three. And um, I was in a, 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 a little cobbled, cobbled street in Macclesfield. And uh, my mum had just gone back into my auntie's house to, um, to get my younger sister. And I stood in the street on my own. And I have complete recall of the whole situation, including what the weather was like on the day, uh, which was just a, a, a dull, um, sort of drizzly, still day. And um, uh, this, uh, basically, this light came down into the street from the sky and hovered about, um, I don't know, five feet off the ground, maybe, um, and perhaps six feet away from me. And it you're was looking up at it. Yes, yes. Yeah, you got to be. Yeah. That's right. Well, actually, in, in in retrospect, it might even have been a bit lower than that. Mm. Um, but but um, it, it it was shaped like a light bulb, like the old fashioned, you know, the old fashioned two hundred watt light bulbs that we used to have, the great big ones, uh, back in those days. Um, and the bulbous part was at the bottom, you know. And yeah. I I I just looked at it and. Um, after a while, it just dissipated and just went. But there's no question of any ball lightning or anything silly like that, because it was just a still, quiet day, you know. Um, yeah. And and then mum came out and and that was it, really. You know, we we went home, but I never, ever forget it. You know, it yeah, was. Yeah. So, so how many years then, David? Because at two year old, you wouldn't have had the. The, the knowledge, the base knowledge to discuss this with anybody. So how many years speculating here passed, do you think, before you actually talked about that to your parents? Um, oh, crikey, Bob's that many, many years, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, th these things uh, are kept quiet within families, mm. aren't they? Oh, okay, you know, yeah. you know my, my mum was involved with this for much of her life. And yet she didn't tell me anything about it until I really started uh, to open up to my mum. I must have been, I don't know, 30, something like that, when I was telling my mum about what was happening to me. And, she, and, and then she admitted that, yes, it was happening to her too. And, um, you know, with the old uh, scoop marks and the triangle marks on the body, uh, puncture marks, and they're all in the same place, you know, uh, places on the body. Uh, no matter where you are in the world, it's all the same, all the same damn thing, you know. And and had she obviously she'd carried that then all her life. What about your dad? Had she spoken to your dad about it? I think she'd kept it from my dad. And when when my dad actually did have an experience um, years later, um, he, he was lying in bed one night and he heard this middle of the night heard this uh, sound outside was like a, a big electrical vacuum cleaner sort of thing hovering above the bungalow it seemed and he was so scared he he, he couldn't get out of bed to see what it was right. but, but I know that at that same time my mum was having encounters with with things like um, you know lights in the bedroom um, on one occasion she had um like like a like a, a picture frame size thing maybe about a foot a foot deep by nine inches across that just opened up on the side of the wardrobe with a light inside it um another time about that time she went to the bathroom and the whole bathroom lit up um brightly you know um what, for just a second or stayed lit up? It stayed lit up for a little while. And my mum thought it was maybe, um, uh, I don't know, a, a police helicopter or something, except there's no noise, you know. And mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but my mum used to get marks, um, you know, triangle marks, particularly on the on the arm. Um, and and she get she she got them um, uh, 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 two or three years on the on the run. And they were on the same arm, but in a slightly different place. Yeah. Um, you know, people think there's, well, there still is a, a massive stigma attached to this. 
<laughs> but I can't imagine what it would have been like for your mum in 1940s and 50s when yeah. she's probably got all this stuff like bursting out of her mind and she can't speak to anybody about it. Well, the thing is, my mum my was born in 1928. Yeah, yeah. And um, and I don't know, she, she, she kept stuff to herself. You know, she was... Um, anything like this she would keep it to herself i think she was afraid actually to be honest mm. and uh it was only when i was um brave enough if you like to to talk about it i mean i be I, I mean i became a nuisance in the family uh after the after the major encounter in 1980 um i became obsessed with the whole damn business you know and it, it's it's not it's not wrong to say that not a single day went by when I wasn't thinking about this subject. And, and, and I'm talking about when I was on my holidays as well. Um, it, it, it completely um, consumed, you. consumed me. It did. Absolutely. Because I wanted to know what was happening, you know, what was happening to me, you know, did, did you manage, I'm not necessarily meaning on holiday, but in a in a family environment, could, couldn't you separate it? Did you have to bring it into conversations? Well, to, I, I did, unfortunately, to a, to a certain extent. And, and unfortunately, my wife, who I was married for 40 years, she died 10 years ago now, uh, she, um, she hated it. She, uh, she just wanted a normal life. You know, bring the children up, and and uh, and that was not unreasonable at all. You know, um, but um, uh, I I just couldn't let it go really. And if yeah. if if I ever dared mention it, I I got this big, big, this wave of hatred came flooding towards me. You know, yeah. um, and it particularly affects me because I'm extremely sensitive to energies. Um, and that goes with the psychic ability, which is also connected with all of this, you know. Mm. Uh, so well, do, do, I, I can I can kind of relate to it. I, I'm working on building sites. Yeah. I knew not to talk about this subject, or or be it vaguely. I just yeah. skirted around it because you you become. I, I don't mind pe having a laugh with people and stuff, but it's horrible if you butt a joke every day. Do you know what I mean? So oh yeah. I, I, I definitely separated it because you, you learn your lessons because you you can be on a one on one with a good friend. Yeah. And you'll be talking about this, certain things that have happened, things that you've seen, things that you kind of that you you now believe. Yeah. And when you're with that good friend and they're still good friends, by the way, it's not that you fell out with them. But when you get in a group environment, that good friend then he's got. He's got an army of supporters who are all going to say, and then they like to say, hey, tell them about what you saw and bloody hell. Suddenly, yeah, you're a focus of attention again. So so for you to sort of not be able to let it go. Yeah, it was very, very been different. alienated. Well, so, so do you, yeah. go on, Dave, Robert, uh, sorry. So, so uh, yeah, um, so I actually was living a double life at home. Um, I couldn't be the person that I really am um, because... Um, I, I, what I have to tell you is that the my uh, ET connection is is far stronger than most people's, shall we say? So, um, uh, I mean, yeah, it it really is. It, it it's something that I'm aware that they're they're often with me, um, and. Uh, what message do they impart to you then, or do, well, do you communicate? Well, <laughs> well, the thing is that they're not all the same. You know, I've seen, um, is it four different types, um, and it's with with three of them, it's it's just on their terms. The fourth type was a human, ET, who I met in Adelaide in Australia when I was giving a talk over there in Adelaide. Um, I, I'd been on on the ABC radio network in Adelaide answering questions live um, on crop circles all over Australia, which was quite something. And I also publicized this event that I was going to. <clears throat> and this chap came and um, uh, I could tell straight away that he was most unusual. Um, he was he looked about 30 i'd say 
he sat near the door in the window. He didn't sit in the audience with everybody else. Um, uh, he, 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 would, he was bald. Um, and um, after the, well, during the talk, the crop circle talk, one of the questions that I was asked was, uh, what's the purpose of the crop circles? And, and through my research, um, I, I discovered that the, the purpose of the crop circles is to impart energy into the ley line uh, system. And, um, and, I, and I said that that energy is absolutely essential for all life on Earth. Without it, we would not be alive. No plants, no, no, no anything. And so uh, I'd come to that conclusion because, because I'm sensitive to energy. I remember one occasion I was down in Avebury and I was feeling the energy from the cove stones <clears throat> down there, the, main, the big stones. <clears throat> and there was very little energy coming from the stones when we first arrived, David and I. And um, about 10 days later, uh, I went back to the same place and the energy was so strong that it was vibrating my body. And I could only stand it for about a minute. So anyway, the following day, uh, I went into the uh, Crop Circle Cafe, uh, which was run by Charlie Mallet in those days at uh, Cheryl. And that's where we all gathered, all the Crop Circle researchers. <clears throat> and uh, that was a wonderful time. Um, that would be around about 2002, 2003. And um, a, a chap came in who was a beekeeper. And he was... Um, he brought a, a load of honey in for Charlie to sell for him. And I was talking to him about the bees and he said it had been a very good uh, spring and early summer, uh, but the bees had hardly um, created any honey at all. It was not, not much. Then all of a sudden in this last week, they'd gone berserk and they produced loads and loads of honey. And he couldn't understand why. And I knew why. It was because the energy level had invigorated the bees and the plants and everything, because I, okay. I knew it had gone up. So <clears throat> anyway, just getting back to Adelaide and this um, this ET guy, who I, I now know who he is. Um, he um, after I'd given the talk, you know, p people uh, waited and uh, and asked. Uh, you know, said how much they'd enjoyed it or, or wanted to tell me stuff that had happened to them as well, which is always very interesting. Um, and then he came up to me and uh, he, he said, all he said was, you're right about the crop circles and the different patterns allow for different frequencies of energy to be infused. Mm. And then... Um, he took my right hand, uh, sorry, my left hand with his right hand and pulled it out in front of me. And then he started to uh, connect with the with the energy because I can feel energy, you know, like I can feel that now. Um, and then he moved it up my arm, which I, I felt, and then back down again. Then he started to um, draw the energy off the ends of my fingers with his right hand. Then with his left hand, he started to move the energy across my solar plexus area to, towards this. Now, bear in mind that I'm used to feeling energy. I've felt it for quite many years. But all of a sudden, this energy level went up like a 100 times more than anything I'd ever felt. And it was like our um, auras were completely combined. And I just looked at this chap and I just smile this big beaming smile at him and he beamed this big smile back at me uh, because we knew mm. and um okay. there was um, there's a cia guy in the in the in the room a guy who worked at had worked at cheyenne mountain um, just, just tell us about the cia guy in a minute i'm sorry for breaking your train of thought but okay. otherwise i'll forget okay so and I, I'm, I'm curious yeah to, let's just jump temporarily back to the crop circles yeah yeah and the energies that, the, that that's been imparted on the crop circles yes how did it happen before crops before we man started 
producing crops. Well, it, well, well, well. It, it, the, the thing is, it's got it's got really got nothing to do with crops at all. That's what. Well, yeah. So I'm, that's what I'm wondering. So yeah. why? Yeah, it's not. Why not, do we have to do it in a wheat field or a barley field? It's it's nothing to do with the crop. It's nothing to do. If there was grass in that field, it would happen just the same. Okay. It's it's the yeah. low it's the location that matters. Ah, that's good for me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Because CIA, CIA guy. Because, unless you want to finish that. Okay. Well, so. Um, uh, so I mentally sent a message to my ET friend, said, there's a CIA guy here, but I would never, ever give you away to anybody, you know. Um, and he, he smiled back at me. He knew because he could read my thoughts. I'm sure he could. And then he turned, walked out the building. And no, nobody ever saw him again. And uh, <clears throat> I later found out his name is T-Day. T-E-E-D-E. H, and I've had a connection with him since, because uh, last summer he came and um, took care of me when I was um, looking at a a burial chamber in in Wales, South Wales, near Cardiff, called Tinkins Wood <clears throat> Burial Chamber, and I knew there was something not good in the in the burial chamber, so I I didn't go in it, even though other people were going in. And um, my friend, uh, David, who is probably the most psychic person that I've ever come across, um, he could see my friend T-Day walking around, following me closely everywhere I went. But nobody else, including myself, could see him. And um, he... Are you talking about <clears throat> David Cape? No, I'm not. I'm talking right. about another David who lives uh, uh, down in Newport okay. in South Wales, um, who's also had more encounters than, uh, I don't know, anybody probably would be, you know, the, the honest truth. Yes. So uh, the, the light at two years of age then, yeah. Robert. Yeah, okay. Uh, have you got any more notable, are we going to stay in childhood for a, for yeah, a few yeah, weeks? Yeah, we will, yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, so the next thing was when I was five years old and it was night time, I was in my bed and um, an elephant appeared in my bedroom. A huge African elephant. <laughs> <Sorry. Yeah. laughs> just, just the head, I might say, <clears throat> not the body. But I, I knew at five years old, I knew it was an African elephant. It had the big ears. Mm. It had massive gleaming tusks. And it was moving its head from side to side. It was incredibly powerful. And it scared the living daylights out of me. I, I tried to shout for my mum in the next bedroom. And um, at first I couldn't. Nothing would come out of my, my mouth. Eventually I managed to get squeak some <laughs> uh, mum out, you know. And yep. she came. She stood in the doorway. And um, But she didn't come in the room. I think she was aware she must have been aware there was something really powerful going on there and and i looked at my mum then i looked at the elephant and i looked <laughs> at my mum i looked at the elephant and i thought well my mum's real that's got to be real not that i ever doubted it to be honest with you i mean th this was not a nightmare of any kind whatsoever this was a visit from a very powerful being and what, what message um, I, 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 well, what I can say, I know this was an African elephant, but what I can say is that maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, I was showing some people some of my stuff on the laptop at my friend David's house down in Newport. And after we, I'd done all this, uh, David turned to me and he said, you, you you weren't on your own in the room. There were quite a few people watching what you were saying from the spirit world. Um, they were quite interested. But one person who was particularly interested was um, a person with an elephant's head. And he said his name was Ganesha which of course is the Indian elephant God. Yeah. 
Now, I know that's an Indian, but I, I'm, I'll not change my story just to make it fit. It was an African elephant that I saw. Yeah. Um, and and um, the reason I mention this is because um, I've got a feeling that other people will have seen him as well, you know, had this visitation. And uh, maybe with me opening up about it, they will they will say something. But I, I promise you, this was no nightmare. This was real as real can be. And uh, I think at the end of the day, Robert, <clears throat> the only truth any of us can be sure of is our own. And, yeah. and you're, you're giving us yeah. your, your truth as, as you see it. And there's, there's no hidden meaning in what I'm saying there to, no. to, to you. I mean, I've not written a book like that. And, and wrote other people's accounts off. Do you know what I mean? It's, I, I uh, do. I do. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so, so, so the next thing, uh, I was, I don't know, maybe six. Um, I was um, sitting in the field by our little um, bungalow, our um, prefab, um, under an oak tree, a single oak tree there, and I was trying to make a a nest um, out of uh, straw and mud. Uh, and I was making a right mess of it. It was, I, I was hopeless. Well, and, you're not a bird, are you? <laughs> I'm not a bird. No, that's right. <laughs> but the next thing is <coughs> I've got two people stood at the side of me dressed in silver suits like cycling, one-piece cycling suits, tight-fitting. And they stood looking at me. And I, and I can't remember what they said, but I feel they did say stuff to me. And the next thing I remember, they'd gone and, and, and I was walking back to the prefab and in my hands was an absolutely perfect bird's nest, mm. which I could never have made. Um, so that was another encounter for sure. Then when I was uh, seven and my sister Jane was five, we went on holiday to Prestatyn in North Wales. Now, I've since learned that that area, the Prestatyn, Real, Landudno, is an absolute hotspot of, of UFO and ET activity. I've, I've come across quite a few people who've had encounters there. And um, so on this occasion, it was middle of the day and um, Jane and myself and my mum and dad had, had gone from this old caravan that they were renting and just gone through the sand dune and we were just just on the on the beach by the sand dune and dad said well we're going back to the caravan we're going to make some butties <laughs> and uh, uh, and i said to me dad well can we stay a little bit longer and he said well half an hour and no more my dad was very he was very victorian in his attitude so he was very strict so we behaved ourselves and um but um and we played for a little while in the sand me and jane and the next thing we knew we were walking down the single uh, concrete track through the campsite um and it was much later in the day and whereas it had been lovely and sunny when we were sat in the on the beach there it was raining we were getting wet as we walked and we were completely disorientated both of us my sister has very clear memory of this she can even remember what clothes she was wearing which is incredible <coughs> but there we are it's five years old yeah it's, yeah it's well it, it is but you know i i think it's connected with our, our et connection you know mm. um and um and and so we couldn't find the caravan we must have walked straight past it and then we were taken in by a family who were very kind and they went to find my mum and dad and they were absolutely beside themselves because it turned out we'd been missing for four hours. And of course, we didn't know what had happened. Um, you know, as far as mum and dad are concerned, they probably thought we'd been naughty, you know. Mm. Um, but I'm sure that must happen to a lot of children. Yeah, the devil's advocate here, Robert. But what what would you say to anybody who says, "Well, you, you're seven year old and five year old. You've gone back oh, towards the caravan and you've got lost." No, uh, no, no. Um, how can I put it? 
I've always been a bit advanced, um, Paul. Um, okay. You know, I was pretty bright. I was, you know, head boy at my school, and um, you know, I was I was doing stuff a lot younger than most people, right. um, and um, so I was. I've always been very um, conscientious and uh, did what I was supposed to do. You know, I've yeah, always, I've always, I've always told the truth throughout my life. I've hated liars. Um, and um, no, it was so clear, you know, one minute it's sun shining uh, and, and, and the yeah. next minute it's raining. In a different on us. Environment, we're in a different, yeah. we're in a different place altogether. We, we're probably um, a couple of hundred yards away from where we, where we were playing, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, Which is fascinating because if you'd have been lost over four hours, they'd have found you a couple oh, hundred yards away, wouldn't they? Yeah, no, no trouble at all. And people mm. might say, well, why didn't your parents ring the police and stuff like that? But uh, this was 1959. Mm. And, you know, people didn't have mobile phones. And that was just a, a real, um, you know, um, I don't know, a, an old, very old fashioned campsite there. They didn't, they didn't have phones <laughs> or anything there, you know, no. most, no. most of the, most of the chalets were handmade, you know. <laughs> yeah. All oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. There's you know. no, all these fancy uh, prefabricated things that go up nowadays. I, th yeah. I think Kurt Sky will have already said this and Alison and I know Les will catch up with it, but any questions for David, uh, apologies, any questions for Robert, please put them in caps. And Les will be reading them out in the next 10, 15 minutes. And, uh, yeah, just just fire away because Robert stressed earlier oh. that he does like the questions. So oh, yeah. Let's be, let's be having some. So are we still are yeah. we slowly progressing through childhood? Cause we, we're getting through, but the next, yeah, big, all good. The next big event was when I was nine and my sister was seven. And we were on holiday in Landudno, which... Um, is only a few miles along the coast from Prestatin. And we were in the digs one minute, and the next minute, uh, Jane and I, uh, I don't know whether anybody, well, I'm sure people know what Land Dudno's like. You know, there's Great Orm, which is a, a big, chalky, rocky promontory that sticks out into the sea. And there's a, a, a single track road that goes all the way around Great Orm um, with a, a, a wall to the side of the of the road and then there's a drop down to the sea by rocks which maybe goes down 75 feet maybe a bit more 100 feet possibly in places and so one minute we're in the digs the next minute jane and i are down by the sea by the rocks on the other side of great home and my sister remembers seeing what she thought was like a carousel rotating on the water and um, and then we realized that we were going to have to climb up these rocks to get back, to get to the road. And uh, I'm not very good with heights at all, but we climbed all the way back up those rocks. And at, at, right at the top, I managed to get my sister over the wall first. And then I made the mistake of looking down and I froze and... Uh, it, my sister actually got me over the wall um, and then when we got on, on the road on the tarmac road we walked a few paces and then the next second we were back in the digs again um, my parents knew nothing about it at all uh, so yeah go on. <clears throat> and, and I'm, I'm interested and I don't know how much detail she, she's got but what you said carousel she saw something that looked like a carousel you yeah. know a few years ago i think it was 2019 uh okay. you don't mind me just giving you this one because it's about you this we all me and les all have stressed that the live stream is about you guys but I, okay i just want to throw this in 2019 rick pj and craig came to the cliff tops of bempton on the east yorkshire coast they stayed all night this and and a I don't think Craig were with them on this occasion. It was just Rick and PJ. Went to the car to get warm. And the park near some double gates and they can look down onto the sea. PJ gets out of the car, stretches his legs. And there's something on the sea, the, above the surface of the sea, yep. that he describes. He's done a, he's done a, a, Rick did a painting of it, like a, a carousel. Moving. Oh, right. 
Yeah. And they, they begin to film it, but they've not pressed film, they've pressed record. So they've got the recording of them talking <clears> about <throat> this. But the strange thing is they haven't got enough recording because they thought they were watching this thing. And people who've heard me tell the story don't jump on me because they haven't got the information at hand. But they, they thought they were watching it for, I think, I think PJ said an hour tops. Yeah, they were watching it till first light, or they were stood there till for when they when they come to and decided they were going to go back into the car or down to the cliffs early uh, in the early hours. <clears throat> it would be coming light. They'd been they'd been there three or four hours. Yeah, but they had uh, they've got some missing time. I mean, they both said we can't explain it, but it was just the carousel that prompted it because yeah. they said it looked like a carousel. Turning. Absolutely, because they do they rotate on the on the water. Um, yeah, I know of other cases like that. Great cases. Um, Did she say yeah. it had any colour or anything? She didn't. Uh, she didn't say. <clears throat> I'm afraid. No. No. Um, no. No. That's that's fine. They 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 saw like tips, like like not flame, but colour on the tips of it as they were watching it, and they were watching it through binoculars at the beginning as well. Yeah. So yeah, fascinating. So yeah. let's move on, Robert. <clears throat> all right. Yes, all okay. Good. So that was that was then um then um oh and when i got home from there no i'm 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 i'm, I'm wrong it was when we came back from prestatin after we'd been taken that time um almost immediately after we got home i started with terrible nosebleeds and um, uh, um I, they seemed to last for at least 10 days mm. um uh, I, you know, in those days, you used to have a wash in the sink, you know, <clears throat> and I, I was afraid of, 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 of pushing, getting the water up to my face, you know, because if I touch my nose, boof, all blood would start coming down into the sink. And, um, and, uh, and I'd never had nosebleeds before and I've never had them since. <clears throat> But I'm quite sure I had an implant put in my nose at the time, um, as I've got other implants in me, you know, in my hand and in my leg, and uh, which I do know about. Um, so, um, yeah. So then it seemed to quiet a bit, um, or at least I became a teenager and I was busy with other things, you know. Um, yeah. So, 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 so as you got towards your teens, these things tapered off. They, they these, seem these they, interactions. They seem to, or at least I don't have any memory of them. Um, okay. I, I wouldn't be surprised if if stuff uh, did happen. You know, um, I remember when I was, oh crikey. Well, let me think. Probably about twenty six, something like that. Um, I was. I'm sure I was taken when I was on holiday at Shell Island which is uh, near Harlech in Wales. <clears throat> and um, my mum was taken at the same time. Um, she had a, a needle inserted into her navel and I'm quite sure eggs removed. Um, the, you know, she had the usual um, um, watery, bloody uh, oozing from the navel. Um, and um, whatever they did to me made me so bloody ill um I, I was fine one day on the holiday playing cricket with the boys and uh, and that and then got up the next morning and i i couldn't i couldn't even go to the toilet i was that i was that ill mm. and my parents and my wife took me to a doctor in barmouth and he said get him home as soon as you can so my parents and my wife packed everything up and I travelled home on the back seat of my mum's car. Yeah. Um, and, and what's interesting here is, I, must, I think I'm right. This is prior to you and your mum discussing these interactions. Yes. It? Yes, it is actually. Yeah. 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 So, so do you think all along your mum may have known what had happened? I'm, I'm damn well sure she she knew, but she kept it yeah. to herself. You know, kept it to <laughs> herself. I don't know. I mean, it's not easy opening up about this stuff, you know. Um, uh, you, you know, I've been told to take more water with it plenty of times, you know. <laughs> uh, but I don't care, you know, because the, the truth has got to come out. Um, you know, so, we... so just jumping from Robert for a moment then and everybody else. How many people 
we, once again, we can only speculate, but how many people do you think sit on stories and accounts and experiences like this, even if they're not as many and frequent? Do you think it touches everybody? Me? Yeah. Do you think this subject, the, the, the yeah. alien intervention, I, I, yeah. uh, and I say alien in broadest sense of the word, because yeah. I don't know if they're ET, they could be demons, I don't know what they are, yeah. but do you think it touches every everybody's life at some point? I, I think it touches millions of people's lives, mm. definitely. Yes. Um, uh, you know, many people have uh, encounters and they've no idea that they've had encounters. You know, very often when I'm talking to people who might remember one thing, um, when I talk to them, uh, it seems as though I'm able to trigger memories. Mm. Um, and and they'll say and they'll say, well, I had this happen to me, but nothing else. Oh, when the, oh, oh, but then something else did happen. Then and this, that, and the other. You know, like yeah. like my my friend Beata from Canada, she lives in Saskatoon and she's had quite a few encounters. But on one encounter, she was um, she was doing this like outward bound course when she was a teenager, r right in the nor northern parts of um, Canada, um, and. Part of this course was that she had to spend one night on her own on this island in the middle of a lake. And um, so she was dropped off by canoe and her gear was thrown onto the island. And um, and so uh, she she sat down on a rock and just looked down in the water and so started to say her name for some reason which she couldn't understand why and next thing she looked up and these people were coming back round the corner of the island in the canoe and they came up to her and she said to them what are you doing back and they said we dropped me off yesterday and then they said well you've not put your tent up or or any of your gear and so and and she said, oh, oh, I don't know what happened. You know, she tried to make a make nothing of it kind of thing, you know, but she'd been gone for 24 hours. Mm. I mean, you couldn't sit on a rock on your bum for 24 hours, could you? We, no, no. <laughs> just but impossible. Did, did, uh, we'll get to questions in a moment. I'll, yeah. I'll give Les a, a shout and see if there is any. But just before we end that, did she, she's, she's lost 24 hours, but yeah. were there any backstory to it does she remember anything well um she doesn't remember a thing at all about what happened at that time but earlier that year she had seen a ufo with a friend mm. and so um th the thing is that that there are certain people who are known to the ets from the moment of their birth and maybe before that and they follow us all through our lives. And so, um, you know, uh, that's the that's the thing that a lot of people don't realize. They think it's just a, a few encounters, perhaps, or just one encounter. But it's, it never is like that. If 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 you've been taken in childhood, then you will have them with you all your life. And I mean, all your life. I mean, I, st I still get visits. You know, I've had them at the side of my bed and what have you, you know. <laughs> Brilliant. And <clears throat> yeah. uh, we, we're going to pick up on that. I want to talk about 1980 implants. But before we do, Robert, if providing you're happy, yeah. we'll go to Les and see if there's any questions. Perfect. Thank you. Right. Thanks, guys. A great show so far. And yes, we you have generated quite a lot of uh, questions, uh, Robert. <coughs> And uh, I'm going to start with um, some of these you might be able to answer uh, uh, quicker than uh, some others. So I do really want to get uh, through a few of these, but, you know, okay. take yeah, as yeah. much time as you need uh, right. for these, uh, Robert. John Alexander, does Robert think that abductions are physical or virtual? Um, they're physical. Um... Um, 
um, and I know I've had sperm taken, and that's a very physical thing, I can assure you. Um, and um, I learned something the other day, uh, and, 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 and that is regarding the, um, you know, the anal probe, which um, uh, people joke about, you know, the, the Paul in the film, Paul, you know, uh, anyone for, donut, <laughs> for donuts and anything like that, you know. Um, but um, what I realised was that virtually everybody, and perhaps everybody that has that happen to them, is a male. It doesn't happen to females. And why is that? And the reason is that it, it's, it's to um, stimulate the prostate to make the, the male ejaculate, just like we do with bulls and uh, for artificial insemination. That's what it's about because the, you know, the, the, the hybrid breeding uh, program is absolutely real w with some of these ETs. So yeah, it's definitely real, yeah. Brilliant. And uh, Steve 71 is asking, um, when Robert is abducted, does he ever see multiple alien species or just one type? I know you touched on this earlier, uh, Robert. Well, um, crikey. Um, well, um, it, it's, it's just one type that I've seen on on in the abduction you know usually you don't remember a lot about the abduction I, I think a lot more happens than you you have memory of um you know for instance on one occasion um i was levitated in bed and um well I, I, and and i i didn't like it at all because it, it it's a feeling of not being in control uh, at at all and and i had this feeling that if i could just m m i was virtually paralyzed but I, I, I thought if i could just move my hand and just touch my wife just with a finger perhaps it might break the spell and i did manage to do that and i did drop on the bed and then i looked around the bedroom but i couldn't see anybody um at, at all uh, but i knew ets were involved um so and then, of course, what happened next was that I went to sleep instantly, which, again, is something that you don't do if you're if you're in a stressed situation. It would usually take you quite a while to go to sleep. But often if if the ETs are involved, they'll put you to sleep. So um, then the following morning, uh, I got up and I, I got in the shower. And um, when the hot water from the shower hit my... Uh, John Thomas, it stung. And when I looked down, <laughs> and when I looked down at it, it had got it had got a perfect red triangle printed on it. Yeah. Uh, only a small one, I hasten to add. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and and again, you see, I didn't react as you might expect. You know, you, you might be um angry or you know, really upset about these things, but I just took it in my stride as if it was nothing. And within about three or four days, it had faded and gone. But I'm quite certain that was connected with a, a taking sperm. Now, um, about two weeks after that, I went to uh, the UFO conference at Leeds because uh, Dave Caton and I used to go every year. And I I'd, I'd told him about what had happened. And uh, so we, we were sat together and and then uh, Yvonne Smith, who's uh, quite a famous um, abduction researcher, hypnotist from America, was giving the talk and she uh, had had uh, slides up on the, on the big screen. And this this next slide was um, basically um, a picture of denim with a, a hole cut out of it and behind the hole was a piece of skin and on the skin was a red triangle and she said you'll never guess where this is and of course i bloody well did guess because i knew what it was and dave looked at me and he was shocked because i'd just told him that what had happened to me so and this was a person in america i think it might have been one of the guys in the allagash abductions you know, so um, so these things 
are worldwide you know same things happen everywhere yeah. i know i'm going off at a tangent here no, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it, it, no it's, it's all relevant so, okay for the question yeah okay well, well, yeah yeah thanks for that robert uh i've got to mention at this point uh karen c has come in with a super chat poll of 15 pound oh thank and, you very much um karen is saying another fabulous talk really appreciate all you guys do so thank you very much uh, Karen from the truth proof team uh, I've got to say also at this point it seems that uh, when we look at the stats on YouTube Paul is um, is that we have a lot of people who comment on the, a lot of these videos and live streams but they're not actually subscribed so you know if you if you can subscribe uh, yep. if you feel the need that'd be great yeah, I'd, I'd agreed. And before the next question, then, for people who aren't computer savvy, and I'm not that red up with computers, people, when we say subscribe, there's no cost to subscribe. It's just literally, you know, click the uh, like and subscribe button. And it's great. Let's just keep this snowball building and uh, get as many people following because that spirals more reports and more information that we can relay to you guys. So next question, then, please, Les. Yeah, Terry Brown is asking, has Robert ever experienced spiritual activity around him? I know you touched on this earlier as well, also, uh, Robert. Um, well, uh, yes, I have, actually. Um, uh, a few years ago, oh, crack, it might be 15 years ago now, uh, my neighbour across my garden, uh, on the other side of my garden in that house there, um, she she died and six months later i was sat in my conservatory looking across the garden and i was feeling pretty low at the time uh, because of problems with this this subject frankly um i looked across there and the the bedroom window um, curtain was pulled open and there was a lady standing there with a pink dressing gown bright pink dressing gown and i thought um roy who lived at that house her husband had got family visiting you know um so anyway um as soon as she saw me she closed the curtain again um so a couple of days later i went roy was sitting on his doorstep and i went across to uh, just try and cheer him up a little bit and and i told him what i'd seen and i said you know have you had uh, relatives staying roy and he said no not at all he said why i said because i saw this lady in a bright pink dressing gown, open the curtain in that bedroom. Oh, crikey, he said, I thought I've seen my wife walking across the landing, but I couldn't bring myself to believe it. But the pink dressing gown was her favorite. And it made him feel a lot better and made me feel good too. Um, I have also had, um, uh, return visits from my late wife who as i say died 10 years ago now um about what would it be eight months after she died um i was lying in bed and it was the end of february 2014 and um all of a sudden i, I noticed the duvet on her side of the bed we have a king side bed um start to go down and then the bed itself went down as if there was a person in the bed and i just lay there and kind of amazed at what was happening and then it it went whatever it was but i kind of guessed it might be jenny well so then i was really a wide awake and it happened again, exactly the same thing. And then she went away again. And then a few minutes later, it happened again. Only this time, I thought, I'm going to touch her if she's there. So I reached across and I touched her on her leg and she was as warm and soft and, you know, Jenny as she always had been. And, and I took my hand off her leg and I put my hand on her tummy and again it was jen and then i thought i'll um and i've been married 40 years so i think i knew who she was you know and um and then i thought it'd be nice to give her a hug so i went to give her a hug and as i did 
she dematerialized and I got this tremendous like white fireworks display in, in my head. Like I've never seen anything like it. It was just incredible. And um, yeah, that's and I'm, I hope I've not cut across you there because no. I were actually going to break in before let's go to the next question. And you've kind of answered it because I was just I was going to come to you and say, how can we have this physicality? To the spirit, because you you said that the cur the 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 person in the pink dressing gown yeah pulled oh, the curtain across. Pulled the curtain. So my yep. Im my immediate thought was nothing untoward with your neighbour, but maybe he wanted to be feel closer to his wife, and he'd got a dressing gown on. So, <laughs> no, then, but, no, do you no. know what I mean? But that, but then you come with this one, so yeah. you kind of answered it. So oh, yes. yeah, oh yeah, and and I've I mean my friend David uh, down in Newport, he's seen her, and she's given him messages for me, which he didn't understand. But made perfect sense to me, yeah. um, and I had a, a lady visit me who was extremely psychic, and she saw something happen um, in in the conservatory there where, near where I was sat, which again made perfect sense to me. Made meant nothing to her at all. No. So, uh, and it's very, you know, I will just say, um, finally, that you know, Jenny and I. We the last I don't know eighteen months of her life, we 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 had a wonderful relationship <clears throat> as it should have been all the way through, but for this blinking UFO thing that got in yeah. the way, I'm afraid. Um, but but um, um, but she, she's since been back and given me a message. One message was that she understands now. Okay. And that that for me was very very important. And that's uh, really comforting. Uh, very comforting. And another message I got very recently was to stop blaming myself uh, for for anything that had happened. And okay. um, and you you do tend to you know. But um, I I feel like released now. You know I've had because I know that it was David who gave me the message, and I know. If you knew David, you would understand that um, he is incredibly psychic, had so many encounters himself um, and, and his wife and, and children. They were, they were all taken as they were driving down the M5 motorway back in 1990. Okay. Car, right. car, car as well. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Well, we might come to that in a moment. I would see if let... <laughs> Les has got time for any more questions if you're yep. still happy to yeah. answer questions. Do you, want, do you want a couple more questions? Yes, yeah. yeah. I've got one from yeah, Ginge197. Has Robert experienced any poltergeist activity around him or his, or has your mum, uh, uh, did she experience any? Um, well, no, I wouldn't say poltergeist um, because they can be a bit... Um, difficult, can't they? You know, mm, not disruptive. Disruptive. No, I haven't. Um, uh no not not at all um i mean my my youngest sister used to have she used to tell us that she could fly and that she could fly down the stairs and knowing our family i mean that sounds ridiculous but i wouldn't be surprised but the whole thing frightened her a great deal okay. and 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 she turned to religion which she's very happy with that and and I I'm I'm not knocking her choice at all there. But some people can cope with this sort of thing, and other people just can't. You know, so fair enough. I've got a question from Colin Falcon, and uh, is asking uh, Colin's asking Robert, do the marks on on you? Yeah. Uh, the marks you described earlier on, do the marks appear in threes? If so, are they in a line or a triangle shape, and are they painful? Um, not, um, well, um, <laughs> uh, triangle. Yes, I've had, um, uh, a solid, solid triangle on the old John Thomas. I've had three puncture marks in a perfect triangle. Um, I've had uh, double puncture marks very often. It's doubles on the inside of the, of the bicep both sides and inside the the thighs double puncture marks um the only one that i can say that that hurt 
was on the inside of my right bicep. And that happened in October 2013. And that was, um, um, I, thank God I wasn't awake or aware when they did it to me because I had a, a bloody awful bruise in the shape of a heart shape on, on the inside bicep there. And um, if you touched it, yes, it was painful. Um, I took a photograph of it and I have got uh, photographs. Quite happy to let you have uh, that photograph uh, uh, if you want it. Um, I actually, I saw it today. Actually, I had a look at a podcast that you were. Talking oh right, about. okay. But, uh, no, a talk, not a podcast. Yeah, but it was yeah. On, on YouTube. But, yeah, but sorry, but, go on. But the but the the, the 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 very interesting thing about that heart shaped bruise is that some years ago, um, I was doing research and I found a guy in Australia who'd put a, a list of the marks that people get particularly ones that show up under ultraviolet light. And um, down the list there was this heart-shaped bruise about four inches across on the inside of the right bicep. There's a, a bloody picture of it and just the same as mine. So, And that was in Australia. So, again, I'm just sort of alluding to the worldwide nature of this phenomena, you know. Yeah. So yeah, there. Can I can I yeah just come in myself there, uh, yeah. Robert? And uh, so the question from me is: Do you think uh, these marks, bruises, etc., skull marks, are, they, are these coming from contraptions and physical devices that you yeah. attach to when you're? Uh, oh, definitely uh, abducting. Yeah. Yeah, with, without a doubt. Um, uh, I mean, um, so sometimes I've had like a puncture mark on the on the on the. The, L, the arm inside army here uh, where where people would normally take blood and um a few days after the blood has been taken it's then sometimes that i'll get a double puncture mark it's almost as if they're taking blood to test how i am doing if you like and then give me a jab of something else you know um sometimes these things itch quite a bit very very much uh, particularly the ones on the on the leg uh, i've got a scoop mark on the inside of my calf um my sister's got a, a, a beauty um uh yeah <laughs> i've got implant an implant in the in the in the back of my uh um, thigh muscle which i've had from being a child i can feel it through the skin that's quite easy and i've also got an implant in my um here I mean, you can see it's just sort of raised up there. That was a double puncture mark. At one and have time. you had any X-rays that's in, that's confirmed that there's a foreign body there? No, I haven't. I've, I've, I've. To be honest, I've kept away from the medical profession as much as I possibly can. You know, um, mm. uh, Paul, can I just? Nip to the loo for a pee, please. Yeah, please do. Yeah, uh, and uh, it'll give me. Yeah, yeah. Don't sit there uncomfortable. <laughs> Make sure you come back. It's, <laughs> so it might be a good time to just talk about the books. And yeah, next, yeah. And Bloody Les might want to tell us. About, yeah, and Les might want to tell us about what's happening next week. Potentially, we'll do a live stream about Wolflands, but he can tell you that. But uh, anybody interested in the Truth Proof books behind us? You can get them on the truthproof.uk website, which Don Lodge loads all your reports on and anything else, UFO, unexplained, all, all that kind of uh, information's on the website and Don kindly puts that on and the books are there available as paperbacks. So the Truthproof books are also on Amazon by a Kindle version and you can also buy the paperbacks on eBay. Uh, as well, and uh, I'm going to get them back onto Amazon just so there'll be three platforms to go with the books. And yeah, so and plus any reports that people have got, please fire them at myself and Don, and we'll get them uploaded onto the website. Names omitted if that's what's required, and any other stipulations that you've got with the report that uh, you want us to put in as well. So that's my little bit done so it's just perfect that when uh robert went to the uh the toilet so les what's happening next week yeah as uh probably uh if you're um if you've liked the 
the uh, Wolfland's Facebook page, then you'll know there's been some uh, updates on there that we've uh, told you about. And one of the updates is go. that the actual film is finished, oh, but we are trying to position the film somewhere where people can access it. So that might be through a, a distributor who puts it on a on a channel or or whatever means. But um, as, as far as we're concerned, it's uh, it's as good as done. It's been forwarded. It's going through the channels. And yeah, we can talk a little bit more about that next week in a live stream. Paul. Yeah, 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 that's great, Les. I mean, I don't know whether there's. I mean, you guys in, in chat now, you might tell us that you want to do this. If you if you'd like to do a question and answer regarding uh, Wolflands next week, just give us a thumbs up or or whatever you want to do. You know, because primarily this is for Robert to tell us his accounts, not Wolflands tonight. But uh, I'm quite happy to devote a a couple of hours to talking about Wolflands, the the people involved in it, and let's let's have a, st a stream next week about the, the the documentary. I'd love to do that. Right. So we have got you back then, Robert. And yeah. uh... yes, I, I've just uh, checked. Uh, there's, there's no triangles on it. We're all right. Do you know my, my sarcasm? Uh, there's been a few things you've said that uh, it's nearly come out, but I thought. Remain professional. <laughs> <laughs> right, I just might get one question in then before you uh, yeah. um, carry on uh, with what you've got to uh, wrote down, Paul. And the question is from Alex Thompson. The question is, is Robert aware of any ETs that are truly evil? Good question, Alex. Oh, blimey. Um, I, I don't feel as though I've come across any. Um, I mean, I know the Draco reptilians are a, an absolute bloody nuisance. That's putting it mildly. Uh, but um, uh, apart from that, I think I think most of the ETs are just doing what they do, just doing their stuff. You know, uh, I don't think there's any emotion involved with it uh, from an evil or good point of view. Um, uh, I think that um, that that we it don't matter how long you study this subject that we 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 still got so much to learn about what's really going on. Uh, you know um, the different beings that I've seen. I'll, I'll tell you about um, when I was down in Wiltshire with Dave Caton and. Um, we were staying in uh, Dave's caravan. I'd, I'd towed it down there. And of course, we were doing the crop circle research. About 2008, I think that was. And um, we'd had a friend in the caravan all day, Gary from Australia, who's had tons of experiences. And uh, he came over many times and stayed here. Um, and, um, and so we were talking for a lot of the day and it, 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 it towards the evening must have been about nine o'clock i think he said gary said well i better go back to to the digs otherwise i'm going to be locked out uh now we were in a field and the, the, there was a gate on the field which was locked at night so somebody either me or dave had to go out and open the gate for gary to uh, drive his car out so uh, fortunately dave volunteered and uh, because i was once again bursting for a pee actually and so as soon as they'd gone out of the caravan started walking up the field <clears throat> i went in the toilet i'm standing there in the toilet and i heard these little feet it seemed running up and down inside the caravan and of course the only person i thought it might be is david which didn't seem right because it didn't sound like a, 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 a you know a big person and um so um i thought what the what the heck's he doing back already he's only just gone out and um so i came out of the caravan out of the toilet and there was nobody there and um and dave came back about 5 minutes later and I told him what I'd heard. And um, so I'm quite sure it was the little grey ETs. 
so so then david and i uh, we got in our respective beds in the caravan and i'm lying there and the next thing um a gray like the um one in communion in the book communion you know by whitley striver yeah, yeah. that one with the pointed chin and all that kind of business was right in my face right right above me and i, I bet you is i bet he wasn't more than was certainly no more than a foot away from me and he was and he was just staring at me and i didn't feel as if i was being threatened uh, it was more or less um he he was asking me are you okay with this can you can you deal with this and i looked straight back at him and i said yeah i can do i can i'm okay did you say yes audibly or did you say yes in your mind in my mind in my mind because everything's telepathic with these mm. with these uh, beings except the the human ets of course um <clears throat> but i'm sure they're telepathic as well but you know they they will speak <clears throat> but um uh, so, and then of course the next thing, immediately I'm I'm asleep, which again is not something that would you would do, you know, you uh, if you, something like that happened to you, you know. So anyway, the next morning, um, Gary came back, and uh, we started talking, and he said um, it was strange last night when I went out of the caravan because I got part way up the field, and then. I thought that I'd left something in the caravan. So I came back, I left Dave and I came back down the field. And as I got near the caravan, I heard somebody running up and down inside the caravan. But when I'd heard that, I suddenly realized that I hadn't left anything in the caravan and I walked back up the field. But so so they made sure that Gary came back down the field to hear them running up and down in the caravan so that he could corroborate to me that what I'd heard was actually happening. Mm -hmm. And and I have to say that they do this sort of thing for me. It's happened more than once. You know, you see, yeah, you've just boxed your question off for me, because as you said it, I've made a little note there and I'm thinking. I'm not, I don't, obviously you can't deny when you've seen the face looking at you, but no. you're in the feet running up and down. I'm thinking, yeah. this is a bird on top of caravan running up and down the top <laughs> of the caravan. Do you see? And, and you've, you've, but you've closed the door on that because your friend right. came back. Yeah, you yeah, know? he did. And he was, he was meant to come back, you know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, probably about four years ago, I, I had another ET at the side of the bed um he 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 tugged the bedclothes on my side of the bed to grab my attention i was lying on my stomach looking towards the other side of the bed the bedclothes got tugged and i thought to myself hello i've got a visitor you know because i'm not phased by these things at all and yeah, so I, I i turned my head slowly underneath me and i realized i was moving in slow motion and then i and i, and I just looked and this this head was at my level as I'm lying in bed. So I'm, I'm quite sure he wasn't fully material, fully materialized. And the rest of him was materialized in, in the living room down here th through, through, the, through the floor, if you like. But, so but I, yeah. What is the message that they're giving you, do you th Robert? What, <laughs> what, what, we know well, that you've said the, 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 taken sperm they've interacted yeah. with you they've interacted with members of your family yeah but why that why what is the message that they're imparting to you do you think or, or, well, or well okay what is the connection when they come and they look at you yeah i know you got that bit of uh, can you handle <clears throat> this when you're yeah, yeah. in the caravan but yeah you know what is the message what well, the message is <laughs> that as, as, as silly as it sounds i am one of them Okay. And that that sounds ridiculous, but um, I uh, what I what what I didn't know whether I was going to mention, but I will mention. No, it. Well, I know what you're going to mention. I know what you're going to mention. Okay. Uh, and, and and we've not spoken about it, so <clears> you can correct me if I'm wrong. I spoke to somebody today. I told them that you were coming on. Yeah. Uh, quite out of the blue, and 
the person I spoke to, I'll not say his name and you can tell me then if I'm wrong or right. And people, yeah. I assure you, we've never spoken about this. Anybody listening in the chat? No. They told me that they'd been in your company and they'd seen your eyes change. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's a good time to tell us about this. And that's what they told me. And we've never spoken about this, have we? No, never. 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 No, that's no. the truth. No, right. Is that what you're going to touch on? Well, that's just one of the things. Yeah, that's that's on. that's really only one. Um, yeah, what what I, I'm a shapeshifter, and my my face and sometimes even my whole body has changed. Um, I've had uh, three witnesses to to it on two occasions, um, and when it happens, I'm not really aware that it's happening. Um, and I don't seem to have any control over it. Um, it happened when I was in France on holiday with my brother-in-law, who was a retired school headmaster, and it scared the crap out of him. Um, and um, it's... it's. Uh, and can you remember who you were with in the UK when it happened? Uh, I, I can, yes. Um, uh, two ladies in, in, in Congleton that I know... Um, I was in a cafe explaining all this stuff for, uh, to them. And when they when they went outside into the car park to get to their cars, one turned to the other and said, did you see his face change? And the other one said, yes. And it was only half of my face that changed. Not the whole face, just half. One face remained human, the other half didn't. Um so and that has happened to my friend mary in ireland exactly the same thing um and uh, uh then another occasion um i went to see my niece and she took me to see two lady friends of hers i was sat there talking and as far as i was concerned everything was fine and about two months later I called on my niece again and I said, it would be really nice to go and have a chat again with that lady that lives nearby, you know. And she said, well, it's a bit of a problem. I said, why? It's because she said, it's, she's frightened of you because we all saw your face change when you were sat there talking and it was an alien face. Um, then another occasion, um, I was with my friend Gary and and another friend, Edmund, up in um up near blackburn sat in their house in, in in edmund's house and i'm just sat there chilling out in an armchair and ed suddenly turns to me and he says rob and his head went down he said you've you've changed you, you've turned into a a reptilian so and it scared him he, he wouldn't talk to me for about three years um he, he changed his phone number <laughs> fortunately we're friends again now thank goodness i convinced him that you know i'm not an evil you had no knowledge of it i'm not an evil reptile or whatever you know but whatever um so so this has happened several times to me and and uh, i know other people that it happens to as well yeah, well, it, well it were none of the people that you've mentioned that no told me that i i know and, and it's funny thing what you're talking about there I was at the um, conference at, um, uh, well, crikey, uh, Gary Heseltine's conference up in... Yeah, oh, in, uh, I know what you mean. Yeah, well... The, the UFO conference. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, and, and I was getting a bit I was getting a bit fed up. I was sat there in the audience with Dave, Kate, and sat at the side of me, and the speaker wasn't that great, to be honest with you. And I thought, this audience needs shaking up a little bit. If I could change, you know uh my my appearance um that that would wake them up a bit you know um so i sort of concentrated on doing that but as far as i was concerned nothing had happened um and and but uh so the speaker finished speaking and i walked up to the stage and that person you're talking about um well, came... I don't mind me mentioning the name. I was just curious whether you, you were going to come up with it. It's Dion, isn't it? No, it isn't. It's Jay. Oh, Jay. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, well, Dion, who is, do, is doing the Capel Green film, okay, um, he, 
I was talking to him and all of a sudden he said, Rob, he said, your, your eye has changed. The pupil has, has gone to a vertical pupil from just on one eye from top to bottom. He said, yeah. just just a minute, I'll get my best camera because because he's a you know cameraman. And yeah. so he took a photograph of it and he showed it me on the screen on the back of his camera. And sure enough, there it was right from the top to the bottom. So, 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 Robert, these things do not present to order and these things don't happen to order. But no, just, just humor us on the stream because we're not expecting anything. And OK, subconsciously think about that while we're talking now for the last 30 minutes mm -hmm. or so. So we can move on if you want. Uh, yeah. And just briefly, you might not want to talk, talk about your sister too much, but religion versus aliens. Obviously, she's she's had these experiences in early life where she thought that it, it was alien stroke ET related. Yes. And I, I know me and you look at it from a slightly different angle there because I, I simply don't know what they are. Well, uh, and, uh, and well, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing it out because they could be something demonic, in my opinion. But you've not had that experience. The, no. You know, the darker <laughs> side of it. So. No. How does how does she deal with her past life and the the thoughts of what she thought they were then compared she, to the religion? Right. Well, she completely. I mean, she turned to religion when she was in her teens. All right. Um. So she she completely has blotted this out of her life entirely. This is just what m me and my other sister remember about about her. You know. I see. Um. Mm. I, I, another thing I will tell you is that. Um, oh, crikey, I don't know. How long would it go would it be? Maybe about 15, 16 years ago, maybe 20. Um, I woke up one morning and they'd, they, I say they, had changed my eyesight so that everything I looked at, the walls, the ceiling, even the porcelain of the toilet had a diamond-shaped mesh, black mesh on it. As if somebody had got a black felt tip pen and drawn a diamond and then another diamond and just made a mesh of it. So everything, it was a bit like, you know, like the holodeck of the Starship Enterprise. It's kind of like looking through diamond fencing, the it, wire. It, if, if you like, but it didn't, uh, it didn't affect the image that I was looking at, you know, the wall or the ceiling. It was just as if somebody had drawn on it, really. And it wasn't in between either. It, it was, was actually, it, it was, yeah, it was part, part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this lasted got to be 10 days, which was, you know, I, I went on holiday down to South Wales and I, it was still yeah. with me while I was down there. You didn't think about going to an optician or a doctor or no. What's the point, Paul? What's the well, point? Well, no, I, I, it's not a trick question. <clears throat> no, no, no. I, I understand. Uh, well, the thing is, uh, let... what, what I'm saying is, just uh, just to cut across you there. Yeah. Some of these things could be medical. Oh, it doesn't have to be ET related. That's right. what I'm saying. You right. Know? Okay. Well, let me just tell you that my my son's partner is an optometrist. Right. And I asked her about this condition, and she said, in all her years of experience, she's never come across it. I got you. Okay. So in a way, I did ask. Yeah, uh, but it was so within. You boxed that one up as well, which is good. You know, that's, okay. That's good. Well, I haven't finished yet yeah. <laughs> because um, um, I I I had a, a favourite uncle, my uncle Fred, and I used to share this stuff with him because there was nobody else really that I could share it with in in the family anyway, and um, he was he was pretty good. You know, he, he could take some stuff. Um, he, he struggled with the uh, aliens be getting here because of the speed of light and stuff like that. But, you know, he was born in the early 1920s, you know, so fair enough. But so I told him about this happening to me with my eyes and I was disappointed, very, very disappointed because it didn't seem as though he believed me. And so I was I was really very upset about that. Um Anyway, a couple of days after it left me, I went down to see my uncle and he was in a right state. I said, what's the matter? He said, I've got to make an appointment with the doctor. I said, what's up? Yes. He said, because everything I look at has got a diamond shaped mesh over it. And I said, well, uncle, I told you that's what happened to me. And I said, just relax. Give it a few days, maybe 10. 
and it will go and your eyesight will be perfectly fine. And that's exactly what happened. So do you, so do you so, believe that was to give him confirmation? Uh, it was it was to help me. You, you, you know, I, m m these I consider these people my friends, a lot of them. And um, it was very important for, for me. My uncle was the only person that I could confide in. And for him not to believe me was a big, big deal for me. Um, so they made it happen to him just to uh, just so that he bloody well believed me after that. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can I can sort of relate to that. So <laughs> do, you, do you want to jump away from your experiences for a, for a while and tell us about some of the cases you've worked on? Uh, I, 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 am I going to get the name of the farm right? Is it Ripplestone Farm? Ripplestone yeah. Farm. My Ripplestone goodness. Ripplestone Farm. Yeah, Absolutely. And, do you want to give people a background on that then, Robert? Because oh, yeah, well, the Ripplestone Farm case um, was, um, I think it was 1977, 78. It, it was the Coombs family, Pauline and Billy Coombs, who lived with their um, children, their children at Ripperstone Farm, which was a farm in Pembrokeshire near Haverford West um, on the coast. So it was on the cliff tops and it was a dairy farm and uh, Billy was uh, the tenant for the farm. And um, one night as Pauline was driving home down the lane with the children in the car, she saw um, a light, a big bright light that followed the car and subsequent to that she was in the kitchen looking across the fields to to the cliff edge which beyond the cliff was stacks rocks which turned out to be very important and a, a ufo was there hovering on the edge of the cliffs and it went down below the cliff and that was the start of a, a year at least of activity around the farm um and they had visits from ETs, very tall ETs, dressed in like frogman's gear. Um, and um, one of the most incredible things that happened was that one night Billy locked his cows up in the in the barn, and he he, he for the night he walked back to his house, and the phone was ringing, and it was a nearby farm. The farmer was really mad with him. He said, your bloody cows are in my field eating my crops. They've been there for the last, I think he said, half an hour. Well, Billy had only just walked up from the from the barn to the house, which was only yeah. about 50 yards, because I've been to the place, been to the location. Yeah. And he said, well, they can't, they can't be, because I've only just locked them in. Well, he said, I've looked at the ear tags on the cows and the your cows. So he said, right, well, I'll go back and have a look. The barn was still locked, but all the cows were missing. And so him and his son had to go and round up all the cows and bring them back to the barn. Well, this happened on more than one occasion. Um, and I'm not sure. I think Peter Paget, who wrote the Welsh Triangle. Welsh Triangle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Peter um, was there at the farm when it happened again. Um, in, in that case, I think it might have just been from one field to another field. But another friend of mine, Dave Harrison, who lives in Paynton now, who was a member of a, um, a UFO group up near Wigan somewhere, I think, um, years ago. One of the uh, members of the group was a relative of Billy Coombs, and he, he worked for the local newspaper. And he just happened to go down to the farm, Ripperstone Farm, on another occasion when the cows were taken out of the barn by the ETs. So we got confirmation. How many, How many Sorry? cattle? Oh, How crikey. Many? Oh, I would think probably 50 cattle. 50 cattle? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I know, I'm, 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 it sounds like a silly question I'm asking because I'm just trying to, what would the purpose be? What would the motive be for doing such a thing? I, I think it's just showing what can be done. It's, and, it's it's like it's like the it's like the um oh crikey the the um Alan Godfrey case yeah uh, um, where where the cattle 
were were seen walking around the estate uh, and alan godfrey got um a call um to 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 go and shift these bloody cows out of people's gardens and um when he got there there was evidence that there was that the cows had been there you know there was muck and damage but no cows uh, and then of course he had his encounter right. uh, um, with with the craft that was hovering on the road in front of him but the following day they found the the, the cows inside the park behind locked gates right it, it's the same thing they're just showing what they can do you know so, so to jump back to the coombs family I, yeah. I might be wrong here but did they write a were there a book written about that yeah yeah that's I, right I, I, yeah so i've got some vague recollection of of it and uh, it is only vague I've, I've got it up there it's the uninvited okay. the uninvited it's the uninvited yeah, yeah. So, uh, so were the alleged alien being seen on stack rocks yes no yeah, they, yeah. they, they were yeah pauline and the kids were looking down at stack rocks on one one day during the day and it appeared as though a doorway opened on the rocks and mm -hmm. two men came out and stood on the rocks and then went back inside and subsequent to that which is something that nobody really knows my friend david in newport has other friends who were actually were on holiday at the time and they were walking along the cliffs and they saw it happen too so right. so th there was corroboration for it you know it, it, that's another thing paul that i i want to just get across to you is that um information seems to come to me it's as if uh, it comes from all over the world um i don't have to go searching for it it's as if it's uh, they're trying to educate me uh, mm -hmm. so that so that i can help other people with yeah. their experiences particularly contactees yeah yeah and I, and, and I still don't want to move from the coombs family just for a moment yeah what what knowledge do you have on the stone the rock that were found right well the, the, with the whole explain to people because you'll have more knowledge than me on this because it's ages right. since I've, i looked at this book well i've i've never heard anybody else mention it but but me um i was down there with my friend uh, john beardmore and we were walking along the cliff edge looking down at stacks rocks one hand mm -hmm. and looking across the field to the farm on the other hand and there in a direct line between the farm and stacks rocks on the cliff top by the cliff path was a, a a stone now this stone is is made of red granite large isn't it and it's large it's probably what shall i say it's probably about three foot uh i would guess from end to end and it's shaped a bit like a dinosaur's head okay and in the in the in the in the middle of it where the eye might be for instance there's a hole that goes right the way through this red granite boulder. And the thing about the hole is that it's not natural. It has been drilled by some instrument. Now, it's it starts off as a, it's a cone-shaped hole. It so, tapers in, it? so it tapers in as it gets closer to the middle. And then it tapers out from the middle to the other, the other side, side. Other side. Yeah. and i actually put my hand all the way through it and john took a photograph of me with my hand through the hole but the, <coughs> but the interesting thing is that in the middle of this hole the red granite looks as though it's been melted now what kind of temperature you'd need to melt red granite i don't know but it's it looks like it's run you know mm -hmm. So yeah, it's all rippled into yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So I I took I took well well John took one or two photographs of it for me. Um, that, that's a really interesting stone, and and, yeah. and uh, you know our listeners uh, they might wonder why I'm labouring on it, but it's in the middle of nowhere. It's on some cliff tops. That the actual tool, if we'd got a man-made made tool that could do this, yeah. would have to be probably what. 10 inch across 12 inch across and, yeah. and somehow tapering a bit like you know like a countersink yeah would, would do uh, yeah and then it goes at both sides and and it and it I makes can't see anybody that would go up onto those cliffs and do that and it know? and it makes perfectly in the middle it's perfectly aligned so you couldn't start at one side and, and start at the other side and drill in 
you know, it's just just not possible. And of course, I think it's a memorial stone. I think it may have been put there by the ETs, just possibly, because it's a it's it's in exactly the same place where Pauline Coombs saw the first UFO go down over the cliff mm. top. But well, that um, that that, I, that I, I find it highly unusual the stone. Yeah. But as a as a and please don't think I'm being disrespectful to what no. you said. But as a memorial stone, that implies that the ETs think like us, and uh, and I don't know if we know their agenda and whether they place want a stone placed somewhere to commemorate the, the event. Forward, well, I yeah. know I, I know I agree that sounds a bit far fetched, but. Um, you know the ETs were there for a, for quite a long period of time. Right. Okay. They they I mean what what they were really involved with was the local air force base, which was just just up the coast there, um, which actually turned out to be a submarine listening station, um, and we and the Americans were listening to submarines in the Atlantic. Russian submarines in the Atlantic and apparently what happened was that we we picked up the sound from USOs you know alien uh, underwater craft that were traveling at a hell of a speed and the, the 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 ETs themselves weren't very happy about what was being done so they came and went to that base and disrupted the um the computers and everything on the on the base um and um and um i i, I can tell you that uh, uh, i can't be certain it's the same time but i think it was um my friend david happened to be on holiday down there at that time and he saw the body of a man in a white lab coat on the rocks down below oh yes right okay yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and there was a, a there was a military helicopter there and they were playing hell with with dave mm. you know get away get away because they were recovering the body okay um but he so, he took a photograph of the of, so, of the person but it it, so, it was it was it was never shown no, but, 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 so, but, but I think that, that, that that person probably worked at that base and was so disturbed by what happened that he probably killed himself. That's okay, just my thought. Uh, so, so, jumping from that, then I'm I will try and fit some questions in before hmm. end what 15 minutes perhaps yeah. before end, whatever. Uh, do you want to take us to 1980 and the 1980 sighting, right? Or do okay. you want to, yeah, yeah, I'll quickly do that one. 1980, um, it was, um 28th of December, 1980, same date as the Rendlesham Forest case, uh, the main event anyway. Um, and I was driving home uh, um, to, to where I lived, it was a few miles away. My wife was in her car following behind me with my youngest son in, in the car and I got my older son with me. He was only about, what would he be? Five, something like that anyway. And it was nine o'clock in the evening. Um, we'd been visiting her sister. And um, I saw this red light up the road, um, which was too low to be an aircraft because of the surrounding hills and too big to be a, um, a farmer with a lantern in the field. I knew straight away it was something odd, although I didn't know what it was at all. So I followed the light for as far as I could. Then I lost sight of it through this twisty wooded section. And then I came out onto the onto this straight. And at the end of the straight was a lay-by. And I thought, whatever it was, must be around here somewhere. So I pulled into the lay-by, got out of the car and looked up. And there's a bloody great UFO hovering over the top of me. And this craft was... Um, about 85, 90 feet diameter. Um, it was shaped like shape. It was a disc. It was a disc. It had a flat bottom, had a dome on the top. Um, at first, all I could see was the, uh, the the underneath of it because it was so low. It was blotting all the stars out. It was a clear, crystal clear, frosty night, and and uh, the only stars I could see were around the rim 
in between the hills and the bottom of the rim because this thing was only about well it was less than 200 feet above my head anyway maybe 150 maybe 100 feet and um it it was completely silent at the time and it was black it was like looking up a, a sooty tunnel um you know even though it was nine o'clock in the evening uh middle of this end of december and and it was dark obviously um the the sky around was even was brighter than this darkness that i was looking yeah. up you know um and then th th i think something happened and uh i think uh, i had some a time slip of some sort because the next thing it wasn't right above me it was just just over the field uh, not not far away at all you know just i don't know 300 feet something like that um and then i could see oh then it was making a deep rumbling rumbling roaring sound but it wasn't unpleasant on the ears at all um which it would have been if it had been any conventional craft of any kind being that size and that close to me yeah but then it started to move off slowly horizontally no more than 30 miles an hour and i could see that it had what looked like a row of windows all around the bottom of it and i counted the windows three times because i knew that this was an incredible event i may never see anything like this ever again and so i had to make the most of it so i counted them three times and there was there were 11 and a half windows visible from a side on view obviously they carried on around the other side <clears throat> and i'm so glad that i did count them and be certain about them and when i reported this to bufora back in the day that's that's in the report yeah <clears throat> and, and did you see did you see any occupants inside no, this no the, 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 there was a soft light inside inside these things it's they seem like windows to me however what i learned about two years later and this of course is what really started me with my research but two years later i was working in a lady's house and i'd stopped work and and, and i was having a sandwich and uh, I, I looked in her bookshelf and there was a book on ufos and i pulled <clears> it out and had a look and flipped the pages and there was a picture that was identical to the craft that i had seen a full color blooming picture and that picture was taken by paul villa in albuquerque new mexico uh, back in the 60s i think but i'd never seen it before um and when i counted the windows there's 11 and a half windows right on it okay it's the same but, damn craft but now so, now um uh oh crikey the the um the guy who wrote above top secret uh timothy good tim good yeah tim yeah, uh, Tim actually went and visited Paul Villa and um, he, um, uh, Paul told him that these weren't actually windows. This was part of the propulsion system. All I can say is they look like windows to me and they yeah. had a dome on the top and, and it flew away towards Lime Green. Now, which was, which is a couple of miles away. Now, about two or three years ago, through my website that I've got, a chap a local chap got in touch with me to tell me that when he was a boy he'd seen the damn thing fly over his house at lime green <laughs> which was incredible i went to to his house and visited him and talked to him about it and, uh, and the, the 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 what you perceive as windows then robert yeah they, they weren't revolving or anything they, they were pretty not, stationary it was stationary the whole craft was not revolving it was stationary but it was mm. moving to the side it wasn't revolving um okay. and, and um and then the following morning as i was driving to work i drove past that location and i was thinking about what had happened <clears throat> and i'd just gone about a quarter of a mile further up the road and another small craft flew out of the field in front of me about 100 yards up the road in front of me now this was only small it was shaped like a like a big tin can about the size of a small car and it flew out of the field across at a, an angle uh, maybe 30 degree angle going upwards heading towards the hills and there were no windows and nothing on it at all but that was the following morning and then i told 
I told my my uh, my my colleagues at work, and of course they thought I was crazy. Um, but about three days later, one uh, one of uh, uh, my uh, colleagues brought in the local newspaper, which was the Stockport Messenger, which was a free giveaway pay newspaper uh, in those days, um, and all the front page was the headlines were ufo sighted in hazel grove which is about five or six miles that way um yeah. you know um so and that was at the same time kind of validated what you were saying Ab so absolutely <clears throat> so so robert i'm conscious that we've got about 15 minutes left okay so i'm gonna just go to les and see if we've got any questions if that's okay yep fine you know, les? yes uh and uh, I've got a question from Fred Flintstone. Um, do crop circles occur as frequently today as they have in the past, Robert? Uh, no, the answer is no. Uh, the reason is that, um, uh, that they've gone out of fashion to a certain extent. And, and uh, the farmers um, in, in recent years have mowed them out as soon as they've been created um the, the, there was a genuine crop circle uh back in i think 2018 uh, david and i went into it and i filmed it and put it on youtube um and that had some features in it which definitely suggested to me that it was the real thing the vast majority are man-made uh it's field art you know uh, but back in the early late 90s and and early 2000s we did have a few that were the real deal. And and it, if you go in the genuine formation, especially if it's brand new, like I went into one I call the Hubcap Formation at Woodborough Hill uh, near Alton Barnes back in 2001, I think it was. And I was the first person to set foot in it. And I didn't really want to walk in it because it was perfection, you know? The, the difference between a man-made one and a genuine one is chalk and cheese because the genuine ones are laid by an energy which which it doesn't make mistakes it's it's just uh, perfection whereas if you're laying it a stomp it with a stomping board you know you 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 you're trying to go round in the circle and and sometimes you miss the circle sometimes a tractor line crosses the crop circle and the, the circle makers will get distracted by the tractor line and go no start, right. go straight up the, the tractor line and then have to turn sharp left, you know, or whatever. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I've been in, I don't know, well over 100 crop circles, filmed so many of them. Um, and I've been in the real McCoy. And um, yeah, it's a very important phenomenon. And ETs are definitely connected with it, without a doubt. Okay. Yeah. So, so a question from me then, Robert. Uh, if um, these uh, crop circles appeared and uh, there are points on the earth where they're charging the ley lands, yep. is that correct, what you said? Then, uh, But we're not seeing a crop circle, so the ley lands are still getting charged, are they? But we're not, no crop circles have been formed, is that what you're saying? No, no, I, I said that you don't need crops. It could be in a field, a grass field, and you would, and you would get a crop circle Oh, a grass circle, rather, which we've had grass circles as well. We've had them in potato crops. We've had them in rice paddy fields. Uh, we've even we've even we've even had this effect in the tops of trees. You know, it, it's an yeah. it's an energy from the from the craft that um, it, actually the the the, the basic um, crop uh, circle flattened crop is a, natu a natural byproduct of the craft being in close proximity to the ground because there's a rotating energy field underneath the craft which naturally creates this effect okay but 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 the actual patterned ones the genuine ones that's that's done with a different process yeah uh Okay, thanks for that, uh, Robert. I've got a question from Steve O seventy one. A uh, question: Does Robert ever see the aliens shape shift? Oh crikey! Um, well, no. Uh, what can I say? I've had. I remember um, staying uh, at my friend Roy Dutton's down in Torquay, 
Roy was one of the very early pioneers of the crop circle research with Colin Andrews and Busty Taylor and Pat Delgado. And um, uh, I was in my bedroom, um, a lovely view uh, from his, from the bedroom across Tor Bay. It was a full moon and um, it was really light. The curtains were wide open and I suddenly felt um, a tingling in my um, ankles, in my heels. So I reached down the bed to see what it was and I couldn't feel anything. But then the next thing uh, that happened was a pressure came on my stomach, pressing down on my stomach. And I started to become paralyzed and the paralysis spread from my stomach down to my feet first. And then when that had taken place, it went from my feet right up to the top of my head. Now, fortunately, I'd got my eyes open while this was happening. Otherwise, I don't believe I could have opened my eyes. But this very often happens when people get paralyzed by the ETs. Um, <coughs> the, uh, if their eyes are open, that, that's the only thing they can move is their eyes and they can look around the room. So um, I was paralyzed. But I, I managed somehow to look over the bedclothes and there standing in front of the wardrobe was a small being and this being was um like a gray except he was made out of light the eyes were black but the whole of the body was bright light but the light didn't um illuminate the rest of the room at all and as soon as i saw the being it shot off and went through the wall. And when it had gone, the paralysis left me. And I got out of bed and looked through the window thinking I might see a UFO, but I didn't see anything at all. But the interesting thing is that a few years later, I was looking at a video um, uh, which um, contained... Um, now, what was it called? Crikey. The Skoll, the Skoll Report, it was. Yeah. That's S-C-H-O-L-E. And it's like about trying to, trying to prove the afterlife. And, and Fabulous so, report. It's brilliant, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so, and so and one of the experiments they did was they got the um, investigators, the, um, the scrutineers, if you like, to get a camcorder and, uh, and, do, and film while the mediums were doing their stuff. And when they, and when the, the film was checked, there was writing on the film, there was, um, there was faces on the film, but most important of all was one of these light beings. And if you look at the skull report, you will see on that film, um, the, the head of a, light, a being uh, with the black eyes, just like a gray. And that is exactly what I saw in the bedroom uh, at, at, at Roy's house in Torquay. So uh, that's an, just another uh, encounter. Now, they're, they're, Thank they're, you. They're, they're, yeah. Well, well, let's see, see if we can get at least one more, maybe two questions <laughs> in. And and a few names, quick. just want to say that I've seen uh, God's Beast, Fred, Mark, uh, we know Alison and Sky are in, <laughs> Lorraine Groves, Pat, who were unwell the other week. Uh, I'm glad you're well now, Pat. Lee Roscoe, Steve Tease. We're going to miss loads of names, guys, but we really appreciate it. And thanks for your support. And over to you, Les. OK, I got a question from Terry Brown. And I know you touched Terry. on it earlier. Uh, is what what do you both, so that's a question to you both, think their agenda is? <laughs> and are there watchers or do they have more of a sinister plan? Are they just watchers or, or do they have a more sinister plan? Me? Well, You're gone, Rupaul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's no, an audio. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm absolutely convinced that the Draco reptilians are, are the main um, rulers of this planet and have been for a few thousand years. Um, and uh, they basically have fun with mankind. Um, we're, 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 this is like their laboratory, and we're, we're in it, uh, as William Tompkins uh, said. Um, then on the other hand, there are other beings like uh, the human uh, type of ETs 
who I have had contact with, uh, and they are here to help us. Um, and they look after certain of us uh, because for somehow perhaps we've got a job here to do um, and maybe it's just about spreading the word, you know. Um, um, uh, and then there are others who are just here uh, doing scientific research and there are others who are doing the abduction, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, you know, the uh, hybrid hybrid children thing, which is an absolute reality. Uh, mm. So, yeah, please carry on, Paul. No, I'm, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer, but my take on it is and I can see a, a few similarities in what you said. For me, the interaction from childhood kind of phased out when I was about 14. Yeah. And, and it, it kicked in. It's almost I do, I do believe that all of us, everybody, everybody's life is sort of mapped out for them. And yeah. as hard as people might want that to get their head around that. But as soon as we moved to this property, it, it weren't months, it weren't weeks. It started again, just just literally started again. But from, from you've had a totally different experience to what I've had. Uh, it, it was everything I experienced was fear based. I think you remember a lot more than I remember. Yeah. Uh, if I didn't remember the bulk of it the next day via a trigger, yeah. by, by, by trigger, I mean, when I sat up in bed in, in 1997, um, and I only know this because we've, I've been going through my medical records with a doctor who's been helping me with this. Yeah. So we, we know the, the dates and everything in 1997. And I've got three holes in my back. If my wife hadn't have told me that morning, she went, oh, my God, Paul, you've three holes in your back. Yeah. The, the memories of the night before, I think there would have a lot of it would have dissipated throughout that day. Yeah, I, I, and I remembered lots of it. It came, it was straight there. But but if I'd put a shirt on because there were no pain, I think I would have forgot a lot of it. So yeah. so I can see similarities. But yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if we, I'm wondering if we've got the the same kind of interaction with these things in in some instances. Yeah, but the, they're using different heads with different I, people, and I, I don't mean the changing heads, but just a different agenda. I I I th I think we we're, we're not the sole concern of one type of et i think um, different et's visitors from time to time that's not my feeling just going okay. back to the, the holes we've, in the we've, we've, we've literally got three minutes david so right. ro sorry robert Go apologies on. okay no no i've done i've done but uh, and i know you okay. wanted to answer that but if we've time for another question uh, for you i will get like to get it in unless okay. wants to wind all right. up all right have you got a question les yeah, we've got a, one from Glenn Rose, and, and uh, the question is, how and where are the alien craft built? Oh, crikey. I have not a clue. In space, underground, uh, who, who knows? Can I just say, regarding the, the, the marks on your back, the holes in your back, my friend David, we, we were um, down in Wiltshire. Uh, not, this is not David Caton. This is the other David. No, yeah, right. he, he came to us one morning um, because his wife had seen a, a bloody hole in his back and um and and he came over to me and my friend to show us and when when we looked at his back there was nothing there it was it was gone and he was he was a bit annoyed about it because his wife had just seen it and told him um mm -hmm. And this has happened before to him as well in 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 another place. But please carry on. No, no, it's, I'd it's like fine. To, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, guys. I'm uh, going to have to uh, just get one squeeze, one more question in. Yeah. Probably Anthony Hudson is asking Robert. Uh, I know you touched on earlier when you said you didn't want anything to do with a medical uh, establishment. No. Uh, but Robert, have you ever had hypnotic regression? No, never. Never. Um, to be honest with you, I'm a little bit frightened to have re because I think some of the memories might not be too nice. Um, and uh, so I've kept away from hypnotic regression. All my memories are my own. <clears throat> yeah. We are out of time, guys. I'm sorry. And uh, great information, great answers to the questions there. And some great questions, you'll agree, Robert, from the people in the chat tonight. Absolutely. Robert, uh, thank you very much. And would you come back at some point? I'd love to. Yes, absolutely. Brilliant. Thank we're you. We're probably just we're probably just touched on a fraction of what you've got to tell us, Robert. So I yeah, reckon. We'll I reckon. Be back. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. On that note, then, thank you, guys, and uh, I'll just uh, close the show down with me. I think, and there we go. So.
thanks Robert and thank you Paul for for coming on uh, tonight's show and as Robert said he'd be glad to come back on again when we give him the uh, the dates next week as uh, Paul and I alluded to we are on uh, with a live stream and we're talking predominantly about the Wolflands the film the making of it the trials tribulations and the uh, and looking into the future not too distant future obviously a way you can uh, get to see this uh, absolutely fantastic film and uh, I've got to say that even though uh, <laughs> a little bit biased there uh, we're working three years on it with Paul but nevertheless it's uh, been a fantastic journey and me and Paul will tell you more about that next week so on that note I've got to thank everybody for uh, coming on to the chat I apologize for not reading the questions out tonight and I know I know I had lots and lots and lots after the last question that was uh, read out I've got to say you're great supporters of the show and we'd really really love to see you here next week thank you all on oh, thanks guy for moderating bye <laughs>